All right. Hi, everyone. This is Katie Velasquez from Band Director's Survival Guide. I'm super excited that this is our first live Q&A. And, oh my gosh, my phone is so loud. Let me turn it off. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks for being with us. This is our first time doing this. Um, so, I'm super excited to have everyone here. Um, my goal for these Q&As is to have an online resource for teachers, um, band directors and music teachers, for lesson teachers, um, to have your instrumental questions answered by someone who's been playing and studying that instrument their whole lives. Um, and so hopefully from that, from those that information you get, uh, you can take that back to your own band program. And feel confident if you have to make a comment about the percussion section <laughs> or something. So that is my goal here. Um, so my first guest, I'm super happy to introduce um, Matt Richards, the percussionist. And uh, he has played with the Houston Symphony, the Fort Worth Symphony, San Antonio Symphony, basically a Texas percussionist. Um, he's also played with Fort Wayne and New World. Um, and every city that Matt has lived in, uh, he has not only been a thoughtful colleague, you know, that's important in getting the playing gigs, but for teaching also, um, he's been able to create studios wherever he went, and teachers love to work with him. Students think he's really caring and help them helps them a lot with their music and everything. So um, welcome to Matt Richards. We're really glad to have you here. And we have some questions from the audience um, that were sent in to me before. So we're going to start off. Um, but I think the biggest question right now is um, how have you adapted your teaching um, in this new COVID environment? Uh, not in person anymore. So what's different? Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. So um, obviously we're, we're in an unprecedented time and everything's changing the entire system is is breaking down and we're having to find new solutions. And um, first off, I just want to say kudos to all the teachers and educators out there. Uh, I don't think they get enough credit for how much effort it must have taken to overnight completely change their education techniques and and create a system that could function and be effective for the remainder of the school year and also how they're working to create an effective school year next year. Um, I'm sure there's many more conversations to be had on that topic, but I just want to say thank you to, to educators. I, I don't think they get enough credit um, in our society, and, and I just want to say thank you to them. And then on that note, um, for COVID teaching, um, I'd also like to throw in the caveat that we, we can all agree that there, there really isn't any replacement for that in-person uh, lesson, that, that in-person experience. I mean, there's just something about the energy dynamic that a teacher can bring and a student can bring and that group can all bring together. I mean, it's unbelievable what you can accomplish in person, but obviously that's not possible right now. So um, after acknowledging that, that caveat, we have to move forward and see what, what can we do. So. Um, when it comes to, to teaching online, uh, I, I, I mean, I found a few major problems um, that, that came up right away. I've been teaching online for, for about a year and a half now. I started over a year ago before the, this all started um, because I had students that I still wanted to teach and still wanted to study with me, but I just did not live in the same city as them anymore. And you know, you can't drive eight hours for a lesson. It's usually not practical and most people aren't. Uh, don't have the time or the resources to, to make that happen. So online lessons became a really good resource. Um, so some of the major problems that came up right away when I first started a year ago, year and a half ago was, you know, latency issues, like how you deal with, there's a lag, like even for example, um, when you're on a Zoom call uh, with a student and they're playing, there's often a lag and you've, you've probably seen a lot of those memes online of music educators posting a meme of a piece of music and like it's going fine and then it's like whoa and there's like a huge a shell and then a then a shell and all these weird dynamics and stuff that aren't in the part and it's just supposed to make fun of this whole issue um and unfortunately that that issue um isn't isn't going to go away but 
Um, there's a few ways I've found it can really help. I mean, obviously sometimes you just have to tell the student, sorry, you, you gotta, you gotta redo that. It's just, there's too much lag. Um, obviously you can take care of the simple things like making sure all your devices are on airplane mode that you're not using, or if you have family members and they're all streaming Netflix at the same time when you're trying to teach, obviously that's going to slow, slow down your connection. But, but another one I found was, um, that was really helpful for me was just always having the student be in charge of the metronome. Like, hey, put the metronome on 90, we're gonna play through this passage. And what was cool is like right away is if they were in control of the, the metronome, then if it sped up or slowed down, they would still stay with the metronome. So like even if then you would know like, okay, they're not rushing, it's just the internet. Um, and and that, that really helped me start to feel more confident about what I was addressing um, in their playing. And then the other thing you can do is, is simply have them send you pre-recorded videos. It's a great way to practice deliberate practice. I mean, one of the best ways to practice is to just record yourself over and over again. And that's something that's a little more difficult with your beginner students, but with your high schoolers, like absolutely, you can totally get them to send you a recording uh, of them playing and then boom, like there's no lag. You can listen to that end to end and you're like, okay, here's the issues. These are the things I want you to work on. And it kind of helps create that dynamic. And then you can bring that material to the lesson instead of having to worry about, you know, are they going to lag? Can I hear them? Um, Cause oftentimes latency can be so bad that a lesson without a plan can be, you know, um, unfortunately just really frustrating. Um, and another issue I wanted to, I got a couple issues I want to talk about. I'm sorry. And then I'll, I'll, I'll get to the next question. But um, one of the other things that was super difficult at first was how do you correct like a technical error? Um, and what was cool is at first it was really discouraging because, you know, I, I'm a very tactile learner. So I learn by feel and I like to help students get their hands in the position they need to be so they can play effectively. And so they can really be set up right from the beginning and and um what i found was that that was a lot more difficult so i had to come up with a way bigger lexicon of uh of um comparisons like comparative visualizations like dribbling a basketball like pretend you're cracking a whip you know different things to help compare visually the technique to something the students already doing in their life so they can be like oh yeah i, I do this motion every day but now i'm holding a stick kind of thing. And um, the other thing that's cool that you can do a lot more of with video that you couldn't do in a live lesson is you can get all these different camera angles. Like I can be like, like, here's my hand and I can like show them what's happening on this side of my hand in slow-mo. Like, so they can really see what's happening. Like, oh, that's, that's really cool. I had no idea that was happening. And, and that's, that's something you couldn't do in a live lesson. You can't replicate that as easily. So those are ways that you can try to help spin that that online teaching um, into a, a more positive note. And um, the last comment I'll address on this question, because this is, we've been getting a lot of questions about this in particular. And uh, unfortunately, there's no easy answer to this one. But the question is, how do I keep my students motivated? How do I keep my students motivated during this this time? And And the first thing I'd like to say is, you know, your students are they're just like you. You know, they're just a little bit younger. Um, but they're also going through this pandemic with you and they're having all those same emotional feelings and sentiments as well. And so, you know, when you're not feeling like practicing, chances are they aren't either. And um, that's a good first thing to acknowledge. And then after that, it's really important to try to give them things that they can achieve. So like hosting a virtual recital or, you know, activities like that can, can really help or or even, uh, you know, creating something fun, like, hey, let's play to your favorite Ariana Grande song or something, you know, just things that are, you know, they seem silly and, and different, but they're, they're fun for the kids. And, you know, this is a great time for you to use music as a motivator and a almost like a, a distraction from, from the world outside that seems to be falling apart. But you can control, you know, practicing a little bit or, or having a little fun with music. That can be an activity that you know, gives you a little bit of a respite from, from the whole situation. So anyways, I'm sorry, that's a long answer to a, to a complicated question, but what, what's the next question? 
Well, no, yeah, that's okay. It is complicated. It's something that not only percussion teachers are wondering about, but all teachers everywhere, and we're expected to change all this stuff. So it's really helpful to hear like what you are doing to make it work, maybe even better for your students. I mean, that's the mindset that I think at least I'm trying to have is that yeah. this is all really different, and it's really hard if we're not in person to like. Is there any way we could possibly? make this even better for our students. Um, so yeah, that's awesome. Great to hear all that. Um, okay, so I have another question uh, sent in. And so can you just explain like your teaching philosophy, like kind of where you start, where you end, where you're wanting students to go? That would be interesting to hear. Sure, sure. I mean, everyone's a little different. So everyone has different goals. But Generally, my, my, my ultimate goal as a, as a teacher is to help a student learn how to teach themselves, which you know sounds like a, like a bad business model in a way, right? Um, because eventually the student won't need you, but I think it's, it's just like uh, a parent is, is raising their child to eventually, I'm not comparing what I do to being a parent whatsoever, but, but what I'm saying is a parent is, is raising their child to be able to, to live independently and to be able to create their own future. And, and I think the goal of a music teacher is to, you know, allow a student the, the techniques and the strategies for how to practice to be able to actually um, teach themselves and to be able to progress once they eventually leave. Because, you know, with, with a middle school or high school student, you have them maybe six, six, seven years max, and then they're gone. They're going to college. And you might never, you might never teach them again. So, so you want to set them up for success in whatever they might do. And and on that note, I try to think of it kind of like bowling, like um, with a student. Like when you go to the bowling ring at first, when you start, like you have the gutters up, right? Because every time you shoot, it's going in the gutter, right? So we put up those those uh, the gutter guards or the bumpers. I think they're called the bumpers, all right? You put up the bumpers so that, you know, whoa there, buddy, like, let's get you back on track. And then slowly over time, you just take those bumpers away and you kind of allow the student to fail uh, like at the appropriate time so that they learn from it. But you try to make it a really positive experience. And and my, my main goal as a teacher is to provide the tools, not just for music, but kind of just for life because because music is really an allegory for life like music requires all the things life requires you need organization you need creativity you need discipline you need uh, perseverance you need focus and you need to be able to handle adversity and and music is is a really really tough uh it's a tough field and also just as a student when you're competing in region band and all state band you're you're constantly being put to the test against other other people and, and it's important to learn that healthy competition so that when they go you know do their whatever field they do maybe they go into psychology maybe they go into chemistry they have the tools and this method to, to that that they're set up with and so that that's kind of my goal as a teacher yeah awesome and that's kind of like our goal for this whole band director survival guide thing is that we teach teachers how to like be able to take this, become a master teacher themselves. Like we want to be able to help them feel in control of their classes without needing a specialist. They are the specialist. So it sounds like your philosophy is like not only for students, but it goes up the line to teachers and yourself as a player too. Totally. And I might add also that like, if you think about the amount of time that like you or I get with a student, like we, we have an hour, maybe an hour a week with a student. Um, if that, some students only do half hour, some only do 45 minutes. So they have five you know, classes a week every day with the, the band director. So these educators are in front of these students and have a lot more time with these students than we do. And so um, it's really helpful if we collaborate in a way that's really beneficial that we you know we can provide insights and they can provide insights because band directors they're teaching every day all day so they're master master teachers master educators and and just like we play and perform all day so we're master performers and so that that synergy of information is really powerful and and that i think that's 
that's another great goal of this whole project. Um, so we're trying to create. All right, so I am going to ask you, because as a flutist, like I, I know that starting off someone on an instrument it can be kind of daunting. Like, you know, I started playing the flute like 12 or 13 or 14 years ago. I don't exactly remember maybe where exactly I started and what was the first thing I did. So what do you do when you first get a new percussion student? Like what is the first thing you work on with them or the gear they need first? Like where do we start? <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a huge question. So I'm just going to give you like the, the two minute answer. And, and generally most percussionists, and this is known, most percussionists start on snare drum. You, you, you start on snare drum because snare drum is kind of, it's kind of the foundation of everything. Like having a good snare drum technique carries over to xylophone, marimba, glockenspiel, timpani. It, it carries over to everything, accessories, because the motion, the emotion you're going to use is, is generally the same. There's little variations here and there, but it's generally the same. So if you have a really solid snare technique, you can generally carry that over to all the other instruments. So usually we start on snare drum and on day one of a lesson, I'm really just interested in showing the student how to hold the stick and how to play the basic free stroke. And wh what I mean by that is I, I like to show them the grip for the stick. Ooh, I got to put my hand over here. It's mirror image. Okay. So um, I like to show them the grip for the stick. And, and what I use just as a, just as an example is, um, I use what's called a three-point fulcrum, so the stick's actually going to be held between my uh, middle finger, my index finger, and my thumb. And I, I actually do that um, for a lot of reasons, but the main thing is there, there's a big debate, and we're not going to get into it, but there's a big debate about first finger fulcrum versus second finger fulcrum, and people are very, very, a lot of people are one way or the other, and they, they believe that that's the only way. And, and I try to explain to my students that, you know, they, they have to find what works for them because everyone's fingers and hands are, are different sizes. So I start with a three point fulcrum and what I like to get, I like to get the student to just get a basic relaxed free stroke. So what that means is basically the exact same motion as dribbling a ball. You, you just use your whole arm in your hand to get a nice relaxed stroke. You let your wrist be really loose and you let the stick rebound off the head. Now we'll, we'll be making a couple, I'll be making a couple videos to demonstrate this stuff, but, but those are the basic things. And I also just start with having them play these different rhythms without reading. I think that's, that's one thing that might be a little bit shocking and, and different is I think it's the, I, you might know better than me, but I think it's the Suzuki method. They do this. Um, but like the concept is like top down learning. Like if you think about, learning music like people always compare music to a language well let, let's talk about that so like if you're learning a language like you're let's say you, you were i don't know most people learn to talk age one through they and they start picking up more vocab vocabulary from there right like the first thing you do is you just talk a lot you're just learning vocabulary with master speakers right your parents are master speakers they've been speaking 30 years right so you're learning from a master speaker, all right? And you don't start reading until like, what, you're, when do you start reading, like first grade? I don't even know, but it's, it's, Maybe, it's yeah. like a long time after you started speaking because reading is so much more complex than speaking. So um, the same thing is true with music. I think a lot of times we try, we try to teach all of it right at once. Um, and obviously we have an agenda. We have to get them to read music. But I think the first week or so, it's really helpful to just kind of teach them the rhythms and learn to just enunciate it and, and feel that relationship without the added burden of having to read, this is a quarter note, this is an eighth note. And then once they understand how it's supposed to work, when you just show them the symbols, they can really correlate that experience that they've already had speaking it with those symbols and I think it makes it a lot, a lot easier. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of day one. Um, day one's a tough topic for such a short amount of time, but let, let's hear the yeah. next question. Um, well, going off that, so if you start with snare drum, 
how do you know when to then move on to like marimba or something like how long do you stay on snare drum and then how do you know to move on okay well that's that's a good question so th this brings us to like a whole nother topic so so like percussion is is way different from any other instrument because we're the only instrument that like you can't physically touch when you're playing it. there's always an intermediary right there's a stick there's a mallet so like for example if i'm playing marimba and i have to look at up look up at the conductor like i can only see through my peripheral vision the keys which means there has to be like an incredible amount of body awareness and like muscle memory trust which is a huge confidence gap to 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 close all right even for me and I've been doing it for a long time. Like there's exercises just to train that muscle memory skill. Like you could spend half an hour a day training that stuff. All right. But basically what, what, what happens is I think marimba is really, really, it's just to be frank, it's not as fun to teach in the beginning as snare drum because it's a lot slower. Like you got to just spend a long time with the student at the instrument just getting them to be able to be able to identify the individual notes on the keyboard. Uh, I had an advantage when I started percussion because I had already played piano and piano is the same keyboard setup as marimba. So for a student that's never played piano, like you're starting from square one, like you have to just get them. This is a C, this is a D sharp, this is this note. And like, they just have to get used to that first and then you got to add that reading aspect, but I, I don't think you can start soon enough on that stuff because just another caveat with percussion, they're learning marimba and snare drum. All right. Generally, that means you have to have a day of snare drum and then a day of marimba and then a day of snare drum and then a day of marimba because it just takes too long to switch. Like if you have a 40 minute period, you'll get 10 minutes on each instrument if you switch. So you just got to stick with one, get that solid half hour block with five minutes on either end to set up and tear down right so they're only getting half the practice time in school on each instrument so like naturally like your note reading ability on marimba is going to be less than a flute player because they're playing flute every day they're reading in notes every day so it kind of creates a special problem for percussionists that they they have to put in that extra mile out, outside of the classroom to, to learn to read notes because they're really only getting half the time in school on, on reading, note reading. So not you can't start soon enough, I, I would say, for sure. Okay. Soon, <laughs> oh, yeah. man, I can't imagine how many instruments. Okay, let me see what the next question we have is. All right, so do you have any advice um, for teachers who have to teach a whole class of students online like classroom management type stuff or best app to use or microphone any of that stuff what is your advice to teachers who are looking at the fall and going how am i going to teach all the percussionists online sure sure so i think one thing that's really cool about online teaching is you you can teach all of them at the same time obviously you can have like a like a webinar, but I would say like for a webinar, it's probably more effective for you to like just present the material and then leave it open for questions at the end. Obviously you probably can't have a playing back and forth with 15 students. Um, so obviously you want to have them all muted so that there's not like the dog barking, you know, you know, all like the kid getting a thousand Snapchats or TikToks like in the middle of the, the lesson, right? Um, Cause we all know they've got their phone there. Okay. So, um, but the other thing is like the cool thing about online is it really helps you like you can actually split up your classes um, in a way to help you like what's hard about in-person teaching. And this is where I have such admiration for, for band directors is like when I teach a master class, like I'll have like those four students that are like they're in lessons, they practice every day, like they're just crushing it. Like they're they're playing double stroke roles eight weeks into eight weeks into sixth grade. And then you have the kids that like they're in band, but maybe they don't practice all the time and they're having a lot of trouble. And then you have all the kids that are in the middle and it's difficult to make it fun for the kids that are really advanced while also supporting and helping the kids that need a little more help 
to catch up. Um, so it's difficult to find that balance. So with online group teaching, you can really separate out those groups to kind of help cater to their, their needs. And what you can do is you can include a few of the stronger students with some of the students that need more help. And you can try to create a collaboration and use it as an experience to help let that stronger student help kind of teach his, his friends. And, and that, that's, that's kind of some, some ideas that, that I, I find to be really interesting to explore. So. Okay, so you do think that it's totally possible to teach a full class of percussionists online? I don't know. I mean, we're going to have to try it out. We're going to have to see what happens in the fall. I mean, that's a question yeah. we're all wondering. Um, but yeah. um, one of the big problems for percussion is, you know, some of these students just might not have an instrument at home. So that's going to be a whole other issue to tackle is, is you know, how do we how do we get instruments into those students' hands? Um, and, yeah. you know, how, how do we find the funding for that? Some students, you know, don't have the financial capacity to buy an instrument. Some do, but don't have space. I mean, and Marimba is large. So, I mean, you're talking about a, a lot of space commitment. Um, you know, think of a large dresser in your room and, and you've got, you know, a marimba, a small marimba. Um, so it's it's definitely a, a, a problem we're all going to have to keep talking about and solve together. So. Yeah. All right. We'll come back to that one next time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what else do we have? So... How about, um, what are your teaching methods or like what materials do you use for young students, either books or exercises, anything like that, that our teachers could go out and find right now? Okay. Well, since I moved to Texas, I've become really fond of a, of a few books. Um, one of them is, uh, it's a kind of Wiley book. It's called Simple Steps to Snare Drumming. I have it somewhere in here, um, but I really like it. Um, it's a really nice book. It it lays it out in a good format, and and I really enjoy the pacing of of when he introduces techniques and he introduces them in a logical way. Um, I, I find that book to be really good. There's there's two major um, there's two books that are really popular. One of them is a fresh approach to snare drumming, I think, and I think that one's by. I want to say Mark Wessels. And then there's the Simple Steps to Snare Drumming by Kenneth Wiley. I personally like the, the Simple Steps book more, but that's just my, my personal philosophy. They're, they're very similar in the pacing and the presentation of material. But the other book that's really good for students is, is obviously the Rudimental Cookbook. Uh, I'm sure most, most educators already have that. Um, but I've actually just started using my own exercises um, lately. I've, I've actually just produced a lot of my own PDFs and um, those, those are all available for free on my, my website on, uh, mr-percussion.com. Uh, we can, we can, we can post the link, but they're all in there. It's under, I think it's under guided warmups. Um, in there's a guided warmups tab on that site, but there's a lot of free, free resources there. Uh, and I have a lot that I've made that I, I can still upload. So I, I started using a lot of my own stuff actually. So. Great. Yeah, totally. It's like. We all have, at least I had like 20 different flute books in which I used like one exercise out of every one. <laughs> exactly. So you so feel that, like have it all in one place to be nice. <laughs> yeah. And you feel bad to making a parent go buy this, you know, like for example, stick control is, is arguably one of the best resources for a beginning percussionist. And I bought it. I think I have like three copies because I kept losing them and buying a new one. But um, like, for the majority of my life, I've only used, it's page five. It's the first page, but it's page five. I've only used the first page for the majority of my life. And that's typically the only page you have your students use. So you're having them buy this $15, $10, $15 book and only using that first page. So, you know, it's, it's nice to kind of create your own spin. Obviously I'm not copying the exact page, but those concepts, those stick control concepts are, are really nice to just kind of explore it into your own warm-up ideas so totally um can you talk a little bit about um percussionists as part of the warm-up in the band program um because i know like usually there's like long tones that they do the whole band does yeah you know, like concert yeah. f 
So, like, what does the percussion section do during the warm-up? What should they do? Well, for sure, you want to include them in the warm-up if you can. I mean, I'd say, you know, most programs are, are pretty good about, about having percussionists included in their warm-ups, but... I have been in band halls before where the percussionists aren't, aren't warming up with the band. And I think it's, you know, it's really important to try to incorporate them as much as you can. Obviously, there's a few times where you just need them to be quiet because, you know, having 10 snare drums roll is, is, you know, loud and obtrusive, especially if you're trying to like tune a delicate chord, you know, you're trying to get your thirds correct. You can't just have a bunch of snare drummers rolling. But but I think it's really important to try to write out a warm up that they can play along with the long tones of the band because they need that that technical practice as well and i think it also helps them feel included and it and makes them feel valued i think i think um one of the tough parts about percussion is it's just kind of one of those sections that like we always hope will just take care of itself like even in the professional orchestra world i mean like the amount of times a conductor has stopped to to correct me or like ask me to do something differently is light years less than like the string section or the wind section because those sections have a lot of intricate things to put together and they just kind of hope that you know you'll figure out your part on your own um so i think the same thing happens in in middle school and high school band you know you just kind of hope the percussion can take care of itself and self-regulate so i think to get that self-regulation um, that in a way is required, um, you need to have them involved as much as possible so they feel really valued. And, and every once in a while, just talk to them. Be like, hey, like that was great, but let's get this going. Because like if you don't talk to them the whole time, they're just going to feel like they can just do whatever. Like there's no consequence, good or bad. So it's it's really nice to make sure that they are, they're always included as much as you possibly can, as much as you can. So. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, if you don't talk to them, then they're going to be like <laughs> reading books and playing games back there and you'd never know it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've seen game. I've seen students do like push-ups or like just like go <laughs> in a practice room and practice baseball. I've seen I've seen students do all sorts of stuff because they're they're looking for something to do. Right. So, yeah, totally. OK, so let's see. Um, the last question that I have here is. I think something that's on everyone's mind. There are no performances right now. The mm. all-state etudes for high school, and I think the middle school ones also. Yeah. It's all recorded auditions. Um, we don't have any performances there. Like last year, there was no UIL. Like I don't know if marching bands happening. Like what is the point of all this? Like how do we communicate a point yeah. to the students when we don't have any performances? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great question. And I think that the answer and results will vary uh, student to student. I mean, um, it's obviously a lot easier with the students that are really music motivated and that they, they either want to be a music major in, in college or a music educator in college, or, you know, they're just really competitive about making those, those competitions. Um, but, um, you know, Maybe there's no performances live, um, but this is a good time for a, a student to, you know, work on technical problems they're having that they, they didn't have time to work on before. I mean, when you're rolling and you're in, uh, when you're kind of in the meat grinder of, you know, you've got all state solos, marching band season at the same time, and then they've got Christmas break, and then you've got solo and ensemble, and you've got UIL. I mean, a lot of times, they don't have enough time to just work on fixing their little problems. Like you, you've always had, you know, a, a less than optimal snare drum roll or something. And now you finally have time to fix it, you know, um, or, you know, it's, it's, it's still a great time for them to learn because as I said, music isn't just about the performance. They can still perform. I mean, just because they're not performing in an auditorium doesn't mean they can't, perform for their family doesn't mean they can't perform um you know online and obviously i i know that the value of performing online often just doesn't have the same effect um but but it's still a great opportunity i i had a virtual recital recently and i had so many students that um that loved 
preparing the videos and, and some were really nervous about it. And it's really good to help them go through that process of recording because then they're like, oh, that's what I sound like. And you're like, yeah, that's what you sound like. And they're like, that's awesome. Or they're like, oh, I want to work on that. And then both of those responses are great, right? It's like, yes, let's work on that. Uh, and it kind of helps them find their own motivation. So even though there's no live performances, there's, you know, this is a great opportunity for them to learn how to record a successful audition for Allstate because they're going to have to record, if they want to be a music major, they're going to have to record pre-screen tapes for colleges. And they're sure going to have to uh, perform tapes for professional orchestra auditions if they don't make the the resume cut so like these are important skills that you know i know i have constantly been trying to get better at and i think it's so cool that they have the opportunity to learn how to do that like now at such a young age um so so i think i think there are some positive spins on it even though it is very very um it is kind of a very sad thing at the moment so yeah, I guess something I've been wondering, like in my own flute practicing, is like, what is the point if there's no performances at all? If there's not online performances, if there's not in-person performances, like, is there a point to doing music? And so, like, this transfers into like schools' decisions right now. Like, is there a point in having band class yeah. right now online or whatever format it's going to be in? And if there's no performances, like, is it even useful? And I think the answer is yes. Like, Absolutely, yeah. I'm really loving playing the flute right now just because I really like playing the flute, you know, like maybe just learning an instrument is a fun thing to do, like, so a kid can explore some creative side of their thinking instead of, like, just doing math homework all the time or something. So, totally. like, yeah, do you think that's the same way? Like, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I would I would add to that that, you know, education is a great way and music education, especially is a great way to add a balance um, for for a student's education. You know, like we have this idea that, like, if you're not good at math, you just do math more and more and more and more until like you've got it. But sometimes just, you know, you're, you're stuck on a problem. And if you just literally stop and take a break and do something else for five minutes all of a sudden you're like oh yeah of course like i can find x right your algebra homework yeah no of course like that happens to me all the time i'm just i'm stuck on a problem and i'm just like there's it's like there's no way i can solve this problem like it's impossible and then i'll just go and play some bach on marimba for 20 minutes and then i'm like oh yeah i just do this right and so like i think it's it's something that we miss a lot in our culture is is the value of of this balance and it's not just you know each one of these subjects is is extremely important but you know they all feed into each other i think they're all they're all important parts to the whole person so i, I think absolutely you, you the value of music is still there no question yeah totally so we're trying to communicate that with um all the higher ups and everything, so like keep music in the schools, even if it's online. Yeah, totally. it matters to everyone. Totally. Um, cool. Well, that is all the questions I have. So let's. I want to thank you for being here. Um, I don't see anyone chatting now, um, but thanks for everyone who's watching, and thanks to Matt for answering our questions. And we hope that this helps you when you go back to to teach online or in person, however it's going to be. Hopefully you can use some of these points that Matt described in your own classroom. And oh. um, yeah, so I'll post a, a PDF of the questions we went over so that you can review this and kind of know what we covered. So, you know, if you need to watch this one or our next one. So yeah, yeah be on the lookout for any future Q and A's. And yeah, thank you, Matt, for being here. We appreciate it. Sure, sure. And also, I'd just like to add uh, in the comments um, below, we'll, we'll post, um, we'll post my, my email. So that if you have any questions, just, you know, send me send me a Facebook message or, or send me a, an email is probably the best. I'm, I'm better about my email. So we'll, we'll, we'll put that email in there. Um, and you can, um, you know, send me a message, we can talk. So anyways, well, thanks for having me so much. And I guess we'll see you guys uh, 
We'll see you guys next time. Sometime, yeah. Be All on the right. lookout for more Q&As with our experts. Right. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye.